All right, we're good to go. Hey, um, hi, I'm Deborah, naturopath at Nourish Health and Wellness in Petone Lower Hutt, which is in Little Old New Zealand, uh, well away from the US. And uh, this week is our Naturopathic Medicine Week, which is sponsored by uh, the Naturopaths and Medical Herbalists, or NMHNZ, um, and that's our organisation that we belong to as professional registered naturopaths. And our theme this year for our Nat Med Week is bringing communities together. So it's our opportunity to showcase what we do, what naturopaths and medical herbalists do in New Zealand. And I encourage you to check out the website, which is naturopathicmedicineweek.co.nz uh, for more events that are on this week around the country and online. So uh, with me today is Dr. Deanna Minnick. And um, thanks very much for joining us from the US. I know that you're a very, very busy lady and very popular speaker. So I'm very grateful that you've decided to uh, come in and chat with me. It's quite exciting. Um, I'm just gonna do a little bit of an intro. So Dr. Minnick is a nutrition researcher, educator and functional medicine trained clinician. Um, with a very unique approach to nutrition that combines physiology and psychology. And this is what I'm interested in um, about the work that you do. And Dr. Minnick has served on the Institute of Functional Medicine's Nutrition Advisory Board and Curriculum Committee. She currently serves on the board of directors for the American Nutrition Association and is president of the American College of Nutrition with an academic background in nutritional science. And I think... Um, for uh, our New Zealanders, it's really important to understand that this is um, helping us to uh, become a more professional level organisation. In conjunction uh, with her academic degrees and extensive teaching experience at the university level, she is a fellow of the American College of Nutrition, so I've got this written down because I won't remember the names, and a certified nutrition specialist. With over 20 years of experience working in both the food and dietary supplement industries, um, Dr. Manik is also the Vice President of Scientific Affairs for Organic India. And she has more than 40 published scientific, scientific articles and journals such as Nutrients, Journal of Nutrition and Metabolism and Nutrition Reviews. She teaches for the graduate program uh, MS in Human Nutrition and Functional Medicine at the University of Western States. My uh, passion for her work is around the books and the wellness and psychology and um, her passion for helping others to live well using therapeutic lifestyle changes. And uh, website details are www.deannaminnick.com. So I'll post that when we uh, do the video recording. I put a little slide in that will have that information on it anyway. So welcome to uh, our New Zealand little Zoom session. I'm just admitting a few more people. Okay, well, thank you for having me, Deborah. It's a delight to be in the company of uh, my global friends, uh, the New Zealanders. The moment that I'm able to up and travel again, New Zealand is one of the places I'd love to be and, and to spend some time in. So it's really a pleasure to be here with you. It would be amazing to have you here, actually. Um, I think, uh, so we've got a few questions from people that have registered. Uh, what I thought I might get you to start with is just a little bit of maybe an explanation around, I'm particularly interested in the food and spirit and the seven systems of health. I love that. And the eating the rainbow concept and trying to sort of explain to people how that applies to nutrition and, and what you know, just a little bit more about what that what's involved with that, and then we can kind of go into some of the, the questions. Thank you. It's a great question to start from. It's a it's a huge springboard, though. I know, I know. That we could go in, but I'm I'm happy to start there. Uh, food and spirit. Well, I'm I'm first and foremost a scientist. So um, growing up and had a keen interest in science. I studied biology and I also studied English literature in college as an undergraduate. I thought I would go into uh, studying medicine and I ended up going into nutrition of all things. I went into biochemistry. So more the research side of nutrition and less of the clinical side of nutrition. Then I went on for my PhD to study essential fatty acids. And all the while I was going through that academic heady training, I never felt completely nourished. You know, I felt like there was so much more. Yeah. I needed to take other classes. I, I was healing from my own ailments in a variety of ways, especially reproductive issues was something that I wrestled with. And I used wrestled very strategically there. It was really something that I was like 
trying to uh, wrap my arms around. So I began studying spiritual traditions. I got into yoga. I took my first yoga class when I was 19. Uh, I began taking world religions courses, philosophy classes. I had a parallel life. I would go over to my biology courses and, and feel kind of like I was in this environment of like, we just want to figure things out. And then I'd go over into my literature, philosophy, art classes and feel like we just want to bask in expansion. And so I think that food and spirit is the emergence of two paths. It is bringing together the science as a tool, um, the ability and the need and the want to understand, to look at the physical world, and to have that together with all that is art, all that is nature, all that is connected to the cosmos, all that is connected to, you know, what is spirituality in my definition? It's the sense of purpose and meaning and connection. I was trying to figure out, well, how do I put those two things together? Because they seem to live in disparate worlds. I go to PubMed for my science. I go to books for my spiritual experiences and retreats and things like that. And what I decided to do was I needed an operating system. Food and spirit became the operating system. And essentially, it's a color-coded system where I took the backbone of the ancient chakra system. Chakra meaning, it's a Sanskrit word, meaning um, wheels, lots of activity, vortices in the body. And this was more or less perceived as a spiritual concept, but I translated it a bit different, which is why I don't call them chakras in the food and spirit system. They're called systems. And so each color is connected to a part of the body, functions of that body system, and then it correlates with the colors of food, lifestyle habits, more of the energetic framework. And as a scientist, what I was looking for was pattern recognition. Like, where do we see clusters in the literature? And I began to see that red foods would connect to the adrenals. Orange foods, high in carotenoids, would connect to reproductive function. So that's what food and spirit was. Um, and, you know, functional medicine, I think it's pretty close. Integrative medicine gets pretty close. But they were never arty or creative enough for me. Um, part of my healing journey involved painting. It involved uh, really getting into kind of the messy, chaotic aspects that are very, um, almost very different than science, but yet still very connected. And even naturopathic medicine, I've always vibed very closely with naturopathic practitioners because you and I share something in common, which is the love of food, the love of nature, the love of healing, and seeing the interconnection of it all. And that's really, uh, when I talk about food and spirit, that's, it's using an operating system to have a lexicon, to have a way to navigate that very complex web of interconnection. I, th I think that's why it resonated so much with me. I first heard you speak at a, I think it was a metagenics congress in Australia, perhaps on the Gold Coast in the mid 2000s. And I'd never been to one of these things before, and it was all very kind of full on and I remember you getting up on the stage and talking about colourful foods and it was so different to all the other presenters who were very research based and it was scientific and it was dosing and it was supplements and it was all the stuff and it just kind of stuck with me back then but at that time for me personally I was sort of getting more involved with learning more about the scientific stuff and getting a bit a bit more knowledgeable about that side and then in lock, we were in lockdown a few weeks ago and I did a, a webinar through the AIHM and that just I don't know for some reason it just kind of it, it gelled and so and and just kind of having you explain it I think is really good um, from a, from from my perspective it resonates really well with 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 getting people to eat nutritionally because I struggle with putting them on what I call the fad diets you know the the I am keto or I am this or I am that I think they're way too limiting and yes they have a purpose but there's other ways to do it is that something that you've seen in your experience as well because I know that you don't do consults anymore but you still have programs and have done in the past so yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, you keyed into something there. What I noticed is that, um, you know, there can be certain diets that can be seen as therapeutic. But when you really, when you're into science, you know, I feel like for me, the quest has always been, what's the truth? What's the common denominator? Mm -hmm. What's the common thread? What stands true no matter what? And if you look in the literature, you can find pro and con arguments against meat. 
uh, or, or with meat. You can find pro and con with soy, with dairy, you name it. Everything felt like it was an arm wrestle back and forth. Yeah. But what did not feel like it was an arm wrestle was plants. You know, there were the outlier kind of articles on lectins or oxalates or, you know, kind of like isolated components. But when you look at the plethora of data on fruits and vegetables, plant-based ways of eating, and I'm not talking about being a vegan or being a vegetarian. I'm simply talking about plants, eating more plants. However people eat, inserting plants. And that would be our connection to nature. And plants have such intelligence that are informing our neurochemistry, our hormones, our, our skin, uh, all of these different systems. And so I think it's coming into relationship with nature, with the planet, and helping to better modulate our physiology. And I think that we've only started that journey with plant foods. I think, you know, we're still at the basics of can people get five a day, but if they could realize that there's a functional signature to these different colors, like I key into color because to me that is science and that is art. Yeah. Color is the divining rod between them both, right? Because color reflects pigments, which tells me flavonoids, carotenoids. Uh, it can say something about chlorophyll. Um, as much as that could be an art, it can be an experience and a way of eating. And I grew up in a very um, strict, restrictive household as it related to eating. And I had disordered eating habits. And as a result of that, I felt like the head wasn't working too much for me as it related to my food. I needed something artful and expressive and playful and inspirational. I, I needed to move away, even though I went on to study it uh, and study it to pieces. I often felt that many of the people that were in the programs with me, we all came from a very similar place, which was an over-intellectualization of our food, yeah. eating, and bodies. And I needed to find a way to balance the masculine of that with the feminine and the story and the experience of food. I think I think that's a really good point because certainly, um, I mean, in New Zealand, most of us, I say most of us, but most of New Zealand grows up on a meat and three veg type diet. We're very, very uh, heavy on dairy products. So dairy products are just drilled into the population as being the best source of calcium. And, you know, we've, we're very much that, that heavy dinner the end of the day meal kind of focused uh, people. So I think trying to get people away from that and eating, eating, I mean, food needs to be fun. It should be an experience. It's like anything, everything that you put in and on your body should be a, an experience. And I think this to me sort of resonates with that. Um, I've got a couple of questions in here that kind of relate a little bit to what you've just said. So one of the, um, so this is from Michelle who's here. And if, if Michelle, if you want to talk to it, you can. Um, it's how do isoflavones and other phytoestrogen estrogens influence estrogen metabolism? Would you recommend soy, organic non-GMO, to women with estrogen dominant pathologies? And if so, how often should they be consumed? And does edamame have the same isoflavone profile as soybean products? So that's another huge question. Yeah, and, uh, I first wanna, and, and I can answer, we can go through each of those questions and I can do my best to, to address them. I first want to say that whether it's soy or dairy or meat or whatever gluten, you know, whatever the, the flavor of the day is in terms of the, the, the nutritional concern, one of the things that I think is extremely important globally, because we're all extremely diverse, is personalization. That's one of the things through the American Nutritionist Association that we have as one of our cornerstones. And it makes good sense, right? You have a different environment in New Zealand than in the US. You have, um, you, different people have different genetics. We have different uh, ways of living. And all of those things stack up into, it's really difficult just to say a yay or a nay and force the issue on any one food because yeah. it's about the context it's about the person, it's the community, it's where it's grown and all of those different features. And I know that all of you have a great understanding of that. So um, to speak to soy, can you read, uh, let's go through them and, and clip through them individually. So isoflavones was the first one. So yeah. what, what effect do isoflavones have on hormone metabolism? So first of all, I think that the phrase or the term phytoestrogen is very misleading. I think that we have given people a very um, alerted, and perhaps wrongly alerted sense that there are compounds in plants that can be dangerous, like 
phytoestrogens. It sounds like, you know, that they're identical to what we have in our human bodies. And we know that the, the estrogens that you find in nature, first of all, they're very complex and they tend to have a sugar group on them. And in order to get the full activity of that isoflavone, you have to remove the sugar group. How does that happen? Typically through the digestive process, but primarily through the gut microbiome and the different microorganisms. So does everybody get the same effect from soy isoflavones? No, because not everybody has the microorganisms that are made and, and created in order to disjoin the, the sugar group from the isoflavone. So a lot of variability right there. Uh, isoflavones are ubiquitous in plant foods, not just soy. They are in so many different herbs. They're in spices. They are in plant foods overall. And in fact, it's really interesting to me that soy gets a lot of attention when flax seeds are incredibly high in some of these, what we might call phytoestrogenic components. Yeah. So I, I would say we need to keep it in perspective. What is the food? And I think the reason why soy had such a backlash is because people were moving into it very intensely. So when you don't have um, animal protein sources, you're gonna move to plant sources and typically that's going to be soy, all of the different permutations of soy, soy burgers, soy uh, hot dogs, you know, and a lot of them are junk, right? Because they have so many different adulterants in them. So it's not the pure food, but let's look at the Japanese traditional diet, what we would refer to in the literature as the 1975 traditional Japanese diet edamame, fermented foods, fermented soy foods. And when you go through that process of fermentation, that sugar group comes off of the isoflavone and gives it more activity just through that bacterial process. So I do think that there's a distinction to be made. I think of life not as yes or no, but to look at the spectrum that tofu might be very different than a soy milk. And what is the quantity? How, how much are we taking, taking in on a daily basis? Where are we within our menstrual cycle if we're cycling? And um, what are all the other variables? How are we sleeping? How are we stressing? And so I, I do think that soy can be, depending on how it's done, and my premise is variety. I'll just put this out there to Michelle and the question because it is a good one. It's a common question that gets asked. I do think we have to cycle through different foods so that we don't create, that, that we get the most from foods, that we have a better nutritional status. And I think if we move away from the food rather than seeing it all the time, then receptors can see it differently. Uh, one other thing I wanna say about soy, and most people don't realize this either. So I believe it was 1996 that the estrogen receptor beta was identified. So for a long time, we knew about estrogen receptor alpha, and ER alpha is the more, well, we would think of that as a receptor that ties into growth, proliferation of cells, right? ER beta is more the yin. It's the yin to the yang of ER alpha. So ER beta keeps the proliferation in check. And what we know about isoflavones is that they're strong ER beta agonists, not ER alpha agonists. They're strong ER beta. So I do think in some cases they can be counteracting the aggressive effects of some of the endogenous or biological estrogens that we take in. So, you know, I, I think, again, we have to weigh it because a postmenopausal woman with very little estrogen, and then if we start to dose with a lot of phytoestrogens, um, as they're called, from soy, we may see different responses. But in general, um, I think that there is some merit to having soy isoflavones, not in supplemental form. I'm not sure if Michelle was asking about supplements. No. Or okay, so I'm, I'm an advocate of the food form where you have a complex array and not such high dosages, right? Then you're, you tend to be more protected uh, and also fermented if possible, non-GMO, organic, as you all know. So um, Michelle, does that answer your question? Is, was there anything else you wanted to add into that one? No, that answer was extremely comprehensive. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, th I thought that covered everything really, really nicely, actually. So um, on the back... mention this real quick, sorry. Michelle, uh, just to track the literature on soy, 
Um, and this is something I recommend to clinicians as well as uh, anybody interested in nutrition. If you go to, and I think you can access it from New Zealand, um, pubmed.com. Yeah. Watch, watch the literature for Mark Messina, M-E-S-S-I-N-A. Mark Messina is a PhD who has been in the soy research field for ages, for decades. And I'm always looking to see what is Mark Messina writing on the latest on soy. So if you're just wanting to get a snapshot, cause it's really hard just to go to somebody's blog anymore, right? Cause you wanna be on the pulse of what yeah. does the science say? Not just what does that person think? And of course science has the filter of the person but still he looks at studies. I think he's much more objective and neutral. His name again is Mark Messina. He's somebody to follow in the field of soy. Yeah, that's cool. What I, what I might do, I've written that down. I can email everyone out with the information anyway. Um, so on that note, like you've mentioned, you use PubMed. Are there other databases or go-to resources for looking up phytonutrient research? Yes. Um, so there's another one called Natural Medicines Database. And it's under therapeutic medical research, I think is the website. But if you we, just look we at- We have access to that. So that's good to know. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty common. Uh, and that is, that's updated with regularity. Now that's not, they would have an entry for soy isoflavones, but you're not going to find, you know, there are thousands of phytochemicals, but the, the major classes should be there. Sorry, I'm just making notes at the same time as trying to listen. And I'm not very good at that at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> I can also write things in the chat if that's helpful and then you can get the notes. Oh, yeah, there. that's a good idea. The, yeah, okay. if I wanted to do that, that would, that would work. Um, so one of the questions that we've had, and this I think came up when I did the um, webinar with you just a few weeks ago, we were talking about where foods come from. So we've got, um, you know, what are your suggestions for people who don't have access, such as location, budget, transport? Um, to fresh, ideally organic, whole foods as a form of medicine. Um, and she's put, I know there are wonderful supplements out there, but, you know, we believe the huge foundation of a healthy lifestyle um, and sustained changes is in our food. And when we're looking at the, the purpose of our naturopathic medicine, work, we're looking at supporting our communities, I think this is probably a really good discussion to have around how to access quality, uh, affordable quality, really, in, in our food. Absolutely. So in New Zealand, do you, do you all have access to community-supported agriculture? So small rural communities that basically pull together uh, the produce and uh, different plant-based foods or even animal foods from a variety of different locations? So yes, you yes and no. Um, there are farmers markets around the country that are really, really good. So I live in Wellington. Um, we don't really have that kind of market. We do have in the city, we have a good veggie market, which people come from you know a few hundred kilometers away to bring. We have one in the lower hut area where I live. And there are still um, local farmers markets and anyone else that's around the country might want to pipe in here um, and say, I think um, what happens in, in the more densely populated urban areas is that we, we rely on the one or two organic stores that are in existence and they're very expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and I think most people, um, uh, this is a gross assumption, but I would say the majority of the population, we in Wellington are very government oriented, government employee, very labor, very heavy labor. So it's lower socioeconomic type income. And um, they just can't really afford to eat it. So the accessibility for them, like the vegetable market that we have on the weekend is really, really good. And we get a lot of growers, but it's mostly not organic. It's mostly just yeah general kind of so 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 the answer really there is kind of yes kind of no right okay i have some ideas then since it's more of a financial accessibility as well it's not so much um you know having quality mm -hmm. so um short list would be the following number one spices spices are concentrated forms of plants they can give appreciable amounts of antioxidants and they're relatively accessible for people yeah. right you can you can find them pretty widely Secondly, I would say teas. And I base that upon my review of the literature on tea. You look at green tea, which is the most well-studied tea on the planet. I would say um, 
you know, the longer steeping time, teaching patients, teaching people about how to drink tea, how to steep it long, preserve the catechins by bringing in a little bit of uh, some kind of acid like citric acid, uh, lemon juice uh, can be useful, but tea. You know, you look at some of the populations that live the longest and uh, many of them punctuate their day with the drinking, the ritual of tea. I mean, I even, <laughs> on my desk, I'm always having a, a teacup of, of something. And, and there was a scientific paper from some time ago showing that a cup or a serving, let's say it this way so that we're all speaking in similar terms, but a serving of vegetables, certain vegetables rivaled or exceeded uh, antioxidant levels of, uh, or, I'm sorry, the tea exceeded the levels of vegetables. Oh, wow. Uh, and that was in some cases. And that was just looking at, you know, I think I looked at phenolic acids. So tea is really precious and it can be, it has a long shelf life. Typically on a tea, you have a two-year shelf life, just like you would have with a spice. So a ground spice powder has a shelf life of 12 to 18 months. So that's the only thing to note is that people turn over those things, that they go through them quicker. Yeah. The third thing I have on my list is foraging. And so um, even as something as simple, and again, I'm not familiar with your, with your botany, with your herbs there and what grows, but I live in the Pacific Northwest of the US. In my yard right now, I've got dandelion greens. There's no sense going to the store and paying dollars for dandelion greens when I could go in my yard and pick them. Yeah. So simple things, and it doesn't have to be extravagant. It could be like one thing, just one simple thing. The, the third, fourth thing um, I will say is one of the things I have found is that, pe including myself, we stick to the same parts of plants and we get comfortable with them. Mm -hmm. So let me give you an example. Um, beets. I just bought some beets and I bought them from a farmer's market. And of course, they're beautiful and you, you get mostly attracted to the beet root. But then you look at the stem and you look at the leaves. Most people cut that off. They compost, they get rid of it, they feed it to animals. They just don't leverage it. But there's a way to maximize all parts of the plant. And then you toss that into soups, right? Soups are very, they can be very nutrient dense. And I think that they preserve well, they freeze well. And it's something that creates satiety. There have been um, studies by Barbara Rolls and others showing that um, having warm soup versus having just like a solid, uh, like a casserole or some kind of um, solid dish that would be comparable to the calorie level of the soup, that you actually get more of a, a satiation effect with the soup, that there's some dynamic there that happens, whether it's the warmth, whether it's the number of sips, so on multiple accounts, having soups and leveraging a lot of those scraps, what we would consider scraps of vegetables, could be better utilized within a broth. So I, are... I, Look, I love that idea. I'm a soup fan. I eat soup all year round, even in summer, because I just it's so easy, and it's a, just a great way of doing exactly that, using up the whole plant, really. Um, so in New Zealand, yeah, we have... We have Dan, we have a lot of weeds. I mean, my garden is full of weeds, but 90% of them are actually edible. And people just laugh at me when I go out and tell them to go and pick the dandelions and make them into a tea and eat the young, fresh leaves. And, you know, the flowers are edible. And it's just, yeah, I think it's a concept that we have a lot of resistance to. I don't know about the other naturopaths here, but I know certainly in, you know, in Wellington, they, they go, oh, but they grow close to the road or they grow on the side of the motorway or... They won't eat them because they're they're on a road front, not in the backyard. And it's like, okay, well, it's very limiting, you know. Um, I guess. Well, and I think we're also limiting uh, them by calling them weeds. Like oh, the moment sorry. yeah, we use yeah. yeah. dandelion greens, or we yeah. use the actual yeah. botanical name. It's like, oh yes, there's something more here. Oh, <laughs> it's yeah. interesting that certain plants have been come to call be called weeds, and um, it's like, why is that? They're very functional. Oh, I know. And it's really, it is interesting. I mean, I call them weeds because that's what everybody recognizes them at. But exactly. Yeah. And that's what I'm speaking to as well. Yeah. It's, it's quite bizarre because I can go out and actually make a salad from the weeds in my garden quite comfortably. And I remember when my stepson was little, he said to me, I'm not eating that. That's just leaves. And I said, Absolutely, <laughs> it's leaves. So, you know, I'm totally on board with that one. Um, hopefully that answers that question. I think um, that was from Katie. I'm not sure if she's here. No, Katie's not on here. So Sharon's just popped a question in the chat. She's got, have you done research on blue zone areas of the world? Um, hang on, 
let me bring that up and read it, um, highest level and what there is in common with their diet? That's an interesting question, actually. Uh, actually, there's somebody who's already done that research. His name is Ken Butner. He wrote the book Blue Zones, and he has nine principles that each of those cultures have in common, and they're not all food. Uh, some of them are like sense of meaning and purpose or yeah. movement. Um, but if I think back to, I believe what he had in terms, and you'll have to check because he's the expert on that. Uh, what you do find is, is tea. I, I believe that the, there was some discussion about beverages, whether it's green tea or it's resveratrol uh, or, um, you know, I'm not a huge advocate of alcohol, but I do think alcohol or some type of similar beverage was, was actually on that list. Uh, I think he also had plants, plants in some capacity, but I, again, you'd have to look at the, the specifics. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so we've got another question. This again is from Michelle. It says, can you still receive therapeutic phytonutrient benefits from plants that are not grown organically? And how different are the profiles between organic and non-organic plants? It depends on the plant. It depends on many different things. Like where was that plant grown? Just even if I were to grow an organic plant here, it would be different than the soil in New Zealand and how you would grow an organic plant. You have different environmental elements, different humidity, uh, different pests uh, in, you know, bugs, insects. So it's really hard to say, um, but we do know that the more that a plant is stressed, the more that it's perturbed to manufacture these secondary metabolites to protect itself. And many times those tend to be good for the human body. So can you still get benefit from not eating organic? Absolutely. Most of the studies that have been published are not looking at organic versus non-organic. They're just looking at the whole array of people just eating more fruits and vegetables and seeing benefit of that. So I always say to people, um, you know, I think we, we set the bar way too high for ourselves sometimes. And I would say to be realistic and to be even consistent with the science, it's really just about eating more fruits and vegetables. And I would even extend that into the entire plant kingdom, herbs, spices. Um, and to, to Sharon's question about where, what our culture is doing that live the longest, many times there is some kind of spice that is used. Um, I think of India. I, I was in India uh, earlier this year and had the experience of, oh my goodness, spices in everything. It's just remarkable um, how no meal is, is lacking flavor in any way, shape, or form. And then I started to think about the American diet and how bland, uh, how bland it can be. You know, we stick to cinnamon and pepper and maybe oregano, <laughs> but you know, how do we diversify? That is a way that we can, again, increase nutrient density. I wanted to say one other thing on the blue zones too. Um, aside from the blue zones, keep in mind that the most well-studied diet on the planet is the Mediterranean diet. Yeah. So when we look at what they're eating there, see, but I just don't think it's just about eating because even in studies, when they look at what they're eating, the way that they are and they live in the Mediterranean is very different than in uh, other cultures. Probably New Zealand might mirror some of the Mediterranean kind of lifestyle, although I think there is more similarity with Australia in terms of, you know, just kind of being uh, more driven, more, although it just depends where you are, you know, in the country, right? But in general, the Mediterranean has a feeling of enjoying life. Um, family is important. Movement is important. There aren't huge portions of things. Things are more fresh. So I do think we have to take the, it's not just what you're eating, it's how you're eating. It's when you're eating, it's why you're eating yeah. and with whom you're eating, right? And you all know this. I mean, this is just part of your training and what you already know is just coming back by looking at different cultures. And I think too in New Zealand, like we're very, uh, I mean, we're, we're quite culturally diverse now, but we are a small country. We're, a, we're 5 million throughout the whole entire country. You know, our biggest city is 1 point something million. It's, we're small. And so to try and, and you know, for the, for the size of our country, I think we do really well on the cultural diversity thing. But our traditional diet is, is a very um, British European Australia, you know, the typical kind of that kind of diet. And, and I think what we're trying to do 
as naturopaths, nutritionists, and medical herbalists is, is, is actually get people to experiment outside of that. And it, you know, we've come a long way since um, since I was a kid. But when I, I grew up, my parents had a my grandparents had a garden. My parents had a garden, and we're now looking at a generation of people coming through who don't actually know what it's like to pick a tomato off a plant. We've got infill housing where there's a tiny little space where you might be able to put a planter box with fruits and vegetables and things in it. So, you know, it concerns me as a naturopath that there's going to be more generations that don't actually know what food looks like. Yeah. You know, pre-processed and potentially not even know what, what they look like in the supermarket either. So that's, you know, that's, I guess that around that is, have you got any suggestions how we can combat that? Like, do we just get people to put plants and pots on their windowsill or I don't know, yeah. Well, so here's my approach. So when I was um, more actively seeing clients, um, I would always ask, you know, I have a pinwheel that I start from, which is um, I, I, I use the colors and on this pinwheel, I have things that are food oriented. Then I have things that are emotionally oriented. I have things that are thought oriented. Then I have movement, physical movement. I have things that concern uh, expression and creativity. I have sleep. And then I have uh, more of a spirituality. And I often will say, like, where do you want to begin? You know, this is your journey, not mine. And I want to hold space based on what I can provide. And if I need to refer you to somebody else, but all these paths are going to lead you up that mountain of getting to your better, higher, more um, empowered and transformative self. So where do you want to start? Because if I start to force the issue of food um, and they're not ready for it, then it, it just feels like they, they won't sustain that, right? So I want to meet them where they're at. And, and oftentimes, if they're sleeping better, that will translate into making different food choices. Food Maybe. choices are better, right? So mm -hmm. I'm not concerned which path they take. And, and I know that everything intersects with food anyway, whether it's physical movement, the emotions we feel, our spiritual inclinations, it's all connected. So I help them to see the web of how they're sleeping is how they're eating, how they're eating is how they're feeling, how they're feeding, feeling drives behavior, right? And so um, I try to make it less linear and more web. Yeah. Um, and I, I just, I love, I, this is what I love about this approach. So there's a couple of things that have popped up in the comments, and this is actually really important, I think, for both practitioners and the public. Um, Bridget's comment is she'd love to hear more of your knowledge and work on colors and how they align to each organ system in the body and I know um, on your website there are a number of free downloads and things that we can we can download and, and I've done that and they are actually what I've started to work a lot of my nutritional stuff from it's given me a bit more of a structure I guess if you like instead of just kind of doing it off the top of my head I've now got these beautiful little colored charts that I can show people which is absolutely brilliant um, I guess how else can people find out about more about what you do or how can you how can we do that? I would say yes, my website tells everyone it's the calling card to my books to um, free downloads. So it's deannaminick.com. You can just go there. And then I have two other websites, but you can get to those websites through the deannaminick.com site. So I have a food and spirit site, then I have a whole detox site. So my main um, my main book is, is the whole detox book. I think you have access and you're able to get it there, but it has the whole color protocol, right? So it has that chart. Um, but let me just, but before I even belabor any of that, um, I want to just mention just starting simple. Like one thing I'm going to ask you all that are on the call right now, and even those who are listening later is what is your favorite color? You know, when you don't know where to start, just start really small and basic. And everybody seems to know their favorite color. Even if it's that day, they know what their favorite color is, right? And it can change. For some other people, it's the same color their whole lives. They have this affinity. So you start with the favorite color and you use that as the portal to go in. So as an example, Deb, what's your favorite color right now? Green. What kind of green? How would you describe the green? Is it like a grass green, a lime green? Um, um, so my favorite favorite is a chartreuse green. Okay. Yeah. If that, cool. if that makes sense. Uh-huh. Sure. Yeah. And so um, when you think of that green, um, you know, green is according to the, the chakra system and according to the food and spirit system, it's all about the heart. Yeah. And the heart is all about healing. 
and no surprise that you're in this healing profession. You know, I always ask audiences um, about their favorite color. And if I'm uh, giving a talk to this kind of audience, like all of you, it's either green or purple. It's either green or purple. It's hardly any orange, hardly any red. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. so, so let me ask, oh, and blue sometimes, yes, that's true. Some blue, it depends on how um, intellectual the audience is. If, if it's a more sciencey audi audience, I typically get more blue. So now I'm, I'm gonna run through the colors quickly. Now focus on what color do you not feel an affinity to? What would yours be, Deb? Like if you had to be surrounded in this color all the time. Blue. Blue? Yeah. Okay, so you wouldn't feel a connection to blue. No, blue okay. makes me feel cold. Interesting. Okay. So, and this is just a rough assessment, right? This is just yeah. one place yeah. to start. It's out of curiosity, right? So um, big open heart, lots of uh, work on healing. This is where you're drawn. Blue, depending on the kind of blue, could be area of opportunity. So like when I think of blue for you, I might think of like the throat. I might think of um, truths around food and kind of explore that with you and just use that to go in. In general, red is about survival, safety, security, tribe, community. Uh, orange is about creativity, play. Uh, it's about partnership. And then you've got yellow. Somebody asked about yellow. Yellow is the color of radiance. Um, in fact, there was a study in Manchester, England, and they found that children and adults, when they had to select from a color wheel, they love the color yellow. So they love, most people, when they're asked, they like to look at, it's almost like a sunshine yellow, right? It gives a feeling of like hope and joy. It's the digestive system. It's the fire element. Green is healing in the heart. Blue here, the throat chakra, much like an aquamarine sky blue, right? Surrendering on up. Um, and then we have more of the indigo, which is more of a nighttime sky. This is the intuitive center. And then white or sometimes portrayed as lavender would be more of the spiritual aspects. And so um, that's kind of how I, I work with just seven just to make it easier. Of course, um, in the rainbow diet, I go further into tan and brown and black. And I even get into like, I sometimes I'll lump together blue, purple, and black because some blue foods are so deeply hued that they look black, right? It's, it's yeah. like blackberries. That's why we have blackberries here. Um, so it just depends on that spectrum where people are, but I use it as a rough gauge. So I would be exploring with you, okay, let's explore the truth of your eating, um, how you express yourself, uh, what is true for you? Are you in alignment with your, your truths around eating? How are you eating? Usually um, there aren't a lot of blue foods, right? A lot of sky blue foods. This is the center. It's a portal for taking things in. So I would be asking you, how do you take things in? How do you take your foods in? Are you mindful? Are you sitting in that present moment? Or are you doing multiple things and just taking it? Or are you neglecting to eat because you're way too busy? Or there's something else that's standing in the way of that? And oftentimes, just even starting there is an interesting place. I, I think that's really interesting because there's a lot of truth in what you've just said. I'm sitting here going, wow, that's amazing. Like... <laughs> Here I am thinking I'm okay, but anyway, um, so that that's all all very good. So some Linda's has popped in. Least for like favorite color is black. So yeah, I don't yeah, black's an interesting one, isn't it? Um, from a food perspective, I associate it with burnt food. Yeah, or I I would um black is an absorptive color. So for people who have depleted boundaries, I often put black into the red category. So I go into the earthy notes. Um, so black can be, it, it can just uh, absorb, it, it can be protective for people where they feel like they need a boundary. I think of the New York city black, you know, how people yeah. in New York, you know, busy bustling city, I'm wearing black. Don't talk with me, you know, have my boundaries. Black can be useful. It can be very, um, therapeutic for some people. Um, it may also feel very isolating. It could also feel like absorptive, like you're taking on too much. So to me, black requires an exploration into boundaries. Excellent. Hey, we're just about out of time. I did, um, one of the questions I had was, uh, which book would you recommend? But I think you've kind of said that with the whole detox book, really, eh? 
Yeah, that's because, because you're all a clinical group, I would say whole detox. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I'm not quite fond of the detox word anymore. I mean, I came out with whole detox in yeah. 2016. I don't even really love the diet. My other book is called The Rainbow Diet. And I, I tried to arm wrestle with the publisher. It's like, I don't get into diet. I'm not into detox. And But they said, this is a way that people can understand what you're yeah. getting into because it's kind of deep. As you start going in into the whole detox, I mean, I have a lot of citations. Um, it, it's it's hard for most consumers to really connect in at a deeper level, like just at the surface, right? You know, going forward, I'm very interested in creating um, a connection between science and consciousness, and really getting into that interface through food. Yeah. You know, how does food change our consciousness, change our behavior, change our state of being? How does it change our neurochemistry, our hormones? You know, food contains hormones that are identical to ones that, why don't we just focus on the phytoestrogens? What about dopamine in food? What about serotonin in food? Identical to our serotonin. So I just think it's kind of interesting to see how food can change our consciousness and through eating we're changing our state of being. I, I, I'm really interested. That's where I'm going in the future and uh, hopefully creating an institute around a lot of those concepts, doing research, yeah, having the clinical piece and then educating and informing and inspiring people with the findings. I certainly think that that's a, a way forward, especially with the way we are in the world at the moment with the amount of anxiety and stress and what COVID has done to change our emotional response to everyday situations. And I mean, even here in New Zealand where we've been fairly isolated from it, I think, um, you know, nutrition is, is a key foundation in wellness. So, yeah. Um, yeah, no, you're right. And and we're feeling this, you know, and, and often right before this uh, conversation with all of you, I was listening to a talk and it was all about integral medicine in terms of this is how I've always seen things. You know, the physical world is the, the world of duality, the world of wanting to know, wanting to understand. Then the this, this symbolic or spiritual, like especially during COVID, the questions for me have not been just how do I keep my immune system healthy, but what is the deeper meaning? What is, how is this transforming my life? How am I using this as a divining rod into transformative change at the level of my my spirit like how is my soul growing not just my body staying healthy in my immune system and it's not even just our immune system we know this we know that that's a portal into everything else but how is this a vehicle of my soul's growth and really encouraging sometimes i think even myself you know i can get so mired into symptoms and i can lose myself in my own symptoms to the point that it becomes obsessive right it's like how do i figure this out what's the root cause and when when that happens, I often feel like, okay, I'm not going up and out. And I have a spiritual teacher who would say to me, Deanna, ratchet yourself out, look from above, look down and on in rather than get lost inside. And I think for all of us, since we're in the healing profession, you know, we got here because we needed to heal and we, we are still healing. This is part of our journey. And that is our perception. So I would say, you know, how do we create that expansion between the physical the, du the duality aspect, the tangible, and then the spiritual, symbolic, the story, like, oh, do I have back pain because I'm learning about support in my life? What is this teaching? Is it teaching me to help people that have pain? You know, they're just so much, like, everything is a portal into this deeper, more expansive knowing. So much to um, discuss, really. I think we're pretty much um, just about out of time. So has anyone got any other comments that um, they've popped in there? I think um, just a few little interesting comments. Um, something about a lovely meditation with a raisin. Oh, yeah, I have done that before. Um, would we want to go through? The, you know, I, no, you know, that's so a, that's also a beautiful place to start with one bite of food and really looking at the miracle of that and tracing that into where it came from and taking that in, right? And that's sort of that whole mindfulness approach to eating, actually being yeah. mindful of what's putting you're putting in your mouth, what you're even preparing, what you're putting on your plate, and and etc. Um, I that's pretty much all the questions that we've got. I think we've answered all the things that I had written down. I just want to thank you so much for joining us. I have really, really enjoyed this. It's been fantastic. And if you are coming to New Zealand, we would love to have you at our conference. 
<laughs> would love that. Oh my gosh, <laughs> on my bucket list, I must tell you. I can't believe I haven't been there yet. <laughs> no, no, so close, so close to go to Australia and not to come to New Zealand, but uh, probably a good couple of years away yet. Yeah. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll uh, finish the recording in a moment just to remind everybody that uh, this will be available on our YouTube channel. So feel free to share it with your uh, community, your, your clients, your colleagues, and um, it will be available uh, pretty much forever on there. Um, thanks to Dr. Deanna Minnick for coming, coming on board. When I emailed, I was like, oh, nothing ventured, nothing gained. If you don't ask, but, you know, we don't know. So I'm hugely grateful for that. And just a reminder to check out all the other events that are on on uh, naturopathandmedicineweek.co.nz. And it's been great to see so many practitioners here. It's the middle of the day, so I appreciate people are in clinic. Uh -huh. um, yeah, so on that note, I'm going to just say farewell and thank you once again. Thank you all. Thank you, Deb. Okay. Take care. Take care. Bye.